thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be speaking here today for the next 40 minutes about anonymity. So let me start with the question, okay, wh what does it mean to be anonymous? If we go to the, to the root of the word, to the etymology of the word, this is actually uh, coming from Greek with the prefix an, which means uh, without, and the, thank you, <coughs> and, the, na and the, the word onoma, which means name. So anonymous actually means nameless. It means you don't have a name. So effectively, what it means is that we have some individual, and this can be a person physically present somewhere, or maybe the owner of a device that is being used to conduct a, uh, some transaction, or maybe the owner of a Twitter account or some other online account, a subject that is conducting a payment or a transaction, the writer of some anonymous online text, all of this can be the subject that we want to name, in a way. And the kind of name we might want to attach to this person so that it's not nameless anymore, so that it's not anonymous anymore, it might be like the name in your passport or maybe an ID number, maybe your IP address, or maybe some entry into a database. Uh, what is important is that uh, when you attach a name to someone, you're typically not just attaching a name, you're also connecting the identity of that person to any prior information you might have about them. So you might have a history, databases, or, or knowledge that you have about the past of this person that are associated to their name. So once you learn something new about them, like you are able to identify them in some, uh, in some uh, anonymous transaction, then you would be able also to link it to their history. So being anonymous means that you have no name, and that means that you cannot be connected to uh, other information about you that might be connected to your name. And we have to, to, to think, the way we think about anonymity online often is, is not that, oh, either I know your name or I don't, is usually that you have a, a, a set of names that you know and you want to connect the, the anonymous person to this set of names. So, for example, today we are not anonymous, we have a name tag attached to us, so this is the opposite of, uh, of anonymity, we have our name very visible. Uh, in, in an anonymous case, you would have, you, if you would see me without the name tag, and if you haven't met me before, maybe you wouldn't know my name, and it would, you would be looking at the, the, the table of tags and wondering which one might be mine, right? So this is how we think usually about anonymity. Okay, so we're talking about anonymity online, but anonymity is, is something that existed already before the internet, so we, I wanted to start with, uh, with some examples just to put it in context of what anonymity was uh, before technology entered the scene, right? And when I was preparing this presentation, I was reminded of a, a story from my grandmother, actually, who grew up in a, in a very, very small village in, in, in central Spain, about 500 people, so very small village. So you're very much not anonymous in a place like that, right? Everybody knows you, everything you do is seen, everything you do is recorded, memorized, people uh, take account of it, and it has in implications for your relationships and your opportunities and your image in the village, right? So that means that's very stifling. It's, a, it's very much a surveillance society in a way. So you would, people, that, there's a lot of pre peer pressure to conform, to not uh, go out of the rules, to not do anything that might be not liked by others, right? And then when she was 30, she moved to Madrid, big city, and suddenly she felt anonymous there, right? Because she could walk on the street, she could wear what she wanted, she could do whatever she wanted, talk to whatever she wa whoever she wanted, and there were no consequences, nobody knew her, right? And it was very liberating. So I was reminded, I think, I think it's, this is very much what is happening also, it's, it's a very good analogy for today and our online behavior in the sense that uh, in the internet we often want to have this sense of freedom of being able to express ourselves without things being necessarily weighing in our, the, in, on us for the rest of our lives, which is what would happen if everything is recorded and, um, and um, associated to our name. That's not the only example. So there is a history of uh, books, for example, being published anonymously. Frankenstein was originally published anonymously uh, by Mary Shelley. Uh, the reason is that uh, books written by the fact that the author was a woman would be bad, mm, sort of bad mm, PR for the book. People would think, ah, it's probably not such a good book. So uh, she published it anonymously to not have this uh, sort of count against, against the text so that it would be evaluated without uh, judgments about the author. And anonymity is very important in political speech. It's protected by law. This is a quote by uh, John Paul Stevens, a Supreme Court justice in the US. 
who says that anonymity is a shield from the tyranny of the majority. It does exemplify the purpose behind the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment in particular to protect unpopular individuals from retaliation at the hand of an intolerant society. So it is recognized that anonymity is important because it enables you to say what you really think without fearing reprisals or consequences for expressing your ideas. And as a final example, uh, this man is no longer anonymous, Mac felt, but he was anonymous for a very long time. This was the source of the Watergate investigation. Uh, he was codenamed Deep Throat, and that led to uncovering a big, the, water, the big uh, Watergate political scandal in the, in the US. And he was able to uncover this uh, sort of corruption at the highest levels by being able to speak anonymously. If he had to do it under his name, he wouldn't have been able to give this information without a great cost to his uh, personal life. All right, so that was uh, sort of the, the broader context of anonymity, but what does it mean to be anonymous in the internet? So that's a difficult question because the answer is highly context dependent, okay? It depends on many things. So what does it depend on? It depends on what kind of action or data piece or uh, activity or subject we want to keep anonymous. It depends on what kind of name we are uh, trying to attach to this anonymous person, what available information we have about this individual that we might use uh, to identify the person, what, not just the raw data that we have from the past, the history we have from the past, but maybe we can make inferences from that history that enable us to do further, um, to further processing that aids in, in recognizing the person. And basically in the system there will typically be some leaked information uh, that kind of we can exploit to connect an anonymous person to a name. So a very good system, a very good anonymity system would not leak information. They would keep this completely separate, the anonymous person and the name. But very often we would have leakages that kind of help us either completely succeed or maybe partially succeed in connecting the person to the name. It depends, of course, on the threat model. So who do you want to be anonymous towards? Uh, uh, sometimes it's to everyone in the world, but sometimes it's not to everyone. Maybe I want to talk to you, and I want you to know that you're talking to me. I don't want to be anonymous towards you, but I don't want anybody else to know that we are talking to each other. So anybody observing us should not be able to tell that the person talking to you is actually me, even if you're able to tell that. So that, that is uh, what is usually considered within the threat model. So this is the, the, the entity that we want to be anonymous towards and who will try to put a name on us, to tag, tag us with our names. And typically, uh, um, every system uh, is, uh, is with security and privacy claims, such as this is a, an anonymity system, will, have, uh, will be based on assumptions. Uh, we'll have some assumptions that need to hold for the, the, the anonymity properties to actually be real. And if these assumptions are violated, then usually you have no guarantees anymore, right? So you always have to look at the assumptions that were made for the claim and see whether um, they are actually holding or not. All right, so I will start, uh, I want to, to, to talk about a few examples. And the first one is about data anonymization, which is kind of, if we could do it, would be kind of a privacy panacea, right? Because we have all these data sets that uh, we have collected that are typically related to people because they relate to people's preferences, people's activities, people's purchases, people's locations, all of these things. And we would like to extract value from this data. I mean, this is the whole big data, the promise of big data. We would like to, to learn things about populations. We would like to um, cure diseases. Uh, we would like to do research, innovation, and all of this. And data is extremely valuable to do that. So if we are able to anonymize data, that means that we can extract value from anonymous data sets without endangering the individuals that the data relates to, because they would not face, if they are anonymous, they would not, uh, this, we can publish this data and they would not uh, face any consequences. So, unfortunately, this is a lot harder than, than it seems at first sight. So, to name one of the early examples, um, I mean, of, of course, the first thing you would think about if anonymity means having no name, 
uh, what you would think is that the thing you need to do to make something anonymous is to remove the name, right? That is kind of obvious. So this is what the, the Group Insurance Commission did in the, in the 90s. This was uh, uh, medical insurance, and they had medical, a medical record data set, and um, they wanted to, to publish it, to make it available so that uh, you know, people could do research on this. So what the, the, this data set contained uh, medical data uh, and a name. The name was, of course, uh, removed because that's what making, an, making it anonymous was all about, right? Remove the name and just leave the rest of the data. So ethnicity, visit date, diagnosis, and so on. And I mean, they still had some, ident some sort of personal attributes such as the zip code, the date of birth, and the sex, but not the name. So in this case, the adversary was Latanya Sweeney, a professor uh, in, the, in the US who uh, looked at um, other information that could be out there with a name that could be connected to this data set. And what she did was she purchased the voter list of the state, right? And this voter list contained uh, name, address, and so on. And also the zip code, the date of birth, and the sex that was also present in the medical data set, okay? So she, was, she looked at these two data sets and tried to combine them, and she found that 87% of the people in the census had a unique combination of zip code, date of birth, and sex. So even if, you, if the name had been taken out of the data set, these three elements together acted as a name for 87% of the people. The other 13%, they maybe had one or two or three other people that shared uh, the same date of birth, sex, and zip code, but the others didn't. So uh, basically, once you, you are able to, to have this uniqueness in the, in the medical data, instead of the name, you just look at the combination of zip code, date of birth, sex. You use that as a key to look in the other data set. You see who has that zip code, date of birth, and sex, and then you find the name that is connected uh, to that person. Okay. These are called quasi-identifiers. Quasi so identifiers are typically unique, so every person has a different one. These are quasi-identifiers. In the same zip code, there are multiple people. In the same date, there are multiple people being born, and half, about half the population has one gender and the other has the other gender, right? So these are definitely not by themselves identifying. What is identifying is the combination of the three, people who have this date of birth, this sex, and this. So it's, it's the and function over these three that creates the identifier. So the assumption that, that she broke here was that it's enough to remove identifiers, it's enough to remove names to, to obtain anonymity. Right? She broke that. She actually proposed a solution that is called K-anonymity, which is a very, it's a very popular, there has been lots of follow-up work on uh, database uh, anonymization based on, on this proposal. Uh, and the idea here is that you, general, you suppress some information, so you delete some fields, and some others you generalize. So for example, instead of an exact date of birth, you just have the year. Or instead of having a, a zip code, you kind of generalize to a bigger area, right? So you, you, then you, people become less unique because, of course, they're, you know, you're aggregating, basically, cells. By re reducing the resolution, you're, you're making it less granular, right? So that, that kind of pro provides you with some protection. It also uh, is based on the assumption that we know which relevant information will be available to the adversary. So for example, if we redesign that uh, data release of medical data, knowing that the voter list is available, we can of course modify the zip code, the date of birth and the sex, such that nobody is unique, right? But what if maybe there is another data set where ethnicity and visit date and the name is available? If we haven't taken that into account, we wouldn't have modified those fields and then the adversary could use those, right? So in a way, the technique requires you to know which of these elements will be quasi-identifiers and those are the ones you operate on. So it's, it also comes with important limitations. So, okay, we can say, well, you know, date of birth, zip code, these are, you know, personal information characteristics. They are kind of public. You know, it's not surprising that, uh, that they can be used to re-identify some record that was supposed to be anonymous. So let's look at a, at a more interesting and challenging case uh, that was uh, a few years later. This is the Netflix price data set. So Netflix wanted to have an open competition to uh, improve their recommendation algorithm. 
okay? So they released, uh, they, uh, so that they invited people to create algorithms of recommendations and these people need a, a data set to see like, you know, which films people like so that they can test that their algorithm indeed is recommending things that people eventually actually like and see. So Netflix released uh, uh, half a million uh, records, um, about half a million records, uh, which was less than 10% of the users, and uh, this they removed the name, obviously, that's the first thing you have to do, and they just really left a list of movies and ratings and dates, right? That was, every record was just the list of movies with the date when the rating was, uh, when the thing was created, and the rating, so one star, two stars, or whatever, okay? And uh, in the fact of Netflix, there was a question saying, is there any customer information in the data set that should be kept private? And the answer was no, all customer identifying information has been removed. All that remains are ratings and dates. Okay, and they went on saying, even if you knew your record, you wouldn't be able to recognize it because we introduced some perturbation and only a small subset of subscribers have been included in the data set. All right, so I mean, you see this and you think, okay, yeah, I mean, uh, this is, sounds reasonable, you know, movies and ratings and dates, how is that going to identify me? Now, of course, if you have really clever adversaries, and these two are Arvind Narayanan and Vitalis Matikov, what they said was like, wait a minute, maybe we have another uh, background information, another data set, where we have these same movies and ratings and dates attached to a name. If we can have that, then we would be able to re-identify the anonymous Netflix records, right? And indeed, what they uh, did was to go to IMDb, which is another, uh, you know, uh, internet uh, movie database with ratings for movies, and people have accounts, and they can rate films. And, um, and there you have basically the same information, movies, ratings, and dates, but also the name, right? And their uh, hypothesis was that if a person has uh, an account in both Netflix and IMDb, then the, they will be rating the same movies and they would be rating them more or less at the same time within maybe a few days difference. And if they like the movie, they would give it a good score in both places, right? You don't say the movie is crap in one and it's really great in the other. So there's, there is definitely a correlation there. And uh, basically what happens here is, again, even though each, each movie is seen and rated by a lot of people, potentially thousands of people, the number of movies, of uh, existing movies, is huge. It's very, very, very huge. And each person will have a very small subset of this huge set of movies that they have seen, right? And even though each of the movies have been seen by many, when you start adding more to this combination, who has seen, you know, Titanic on this date and this other movie on this date, then you start becoming very quickly very unique, all right? So that's what they found. It's not that people were unique, is that they were very far, if you plot this in that kind of uh, space, they were, the points were very far from each other. So even if there was some noise in the, for example, the dates between the Netflix and the IMDb, or maybe some movies were missing that were only in one set but not in the other, people were so different from each other that even small deviations were not enough to make them being confused with somebody else, okay? So basically anybody who had an account on both and had reasonably, you know, normal activity in both would be re-identified by their algorithm. And as I say, this is because of uniqueness and sparsity and, and the overlap between the two data sets. So this is a lot less intuitive than the, the date of birth and, and zip code and so on. But basically they showed that this assumption that a simple list of items or preferences is anonymous and cannot be re-identified, this is actually not true. This is, you know, it's possible to do it. So it doesn't stop with preferences. Uh, a big uh, area where uh, data anonymization is extremely challenging is where it uh, concerns location, okay? So mobility traces, human mobility traces are very unique. You, you go from your home to your work, to your friend's place, to the supermarket, and they are not only unique, they're also very regular. People are animals of habit, and we do more or less the same thing every day, right? So uh, there are many, many studies. The most famous one is by Yves Alexandre Monjoie. Uh, this was published in Nature, and they found, looking at a big data set of uh, telco, 
uh, mobility, they found that four points, four data points, are enough to identify 95% of individuals. So 95% of individuals become unique if ju you just take four data points. And it's not even very precise data points. It's a resolution without, within an hour, and a spatial resolution, which is the carrier antenna, which is not, it's not a like, GPS coordinate, it's, it's much broader than that. And even with that, uh, uh, if you make it even coarser, the, the uniqueness uh, doesn't, um, doesn't uh, go away. Like you lose the utility of the data, you have to bear it very much, and you're still not really achieving much in terms of uh, removing this uniqueness. So this is extremely, uh, uh, problematic because a lot of data sets, of course, have uh, location in them. Uh, you might have heard uh, a, a recent example of this uh, Strava fitness application. Uh, it was uploading aggregated heat maps of locations uh, taken from, um, I mean, it was just some fitness app for people to, who go running and so on, and it was basically uploading these tracks and this information as a heat map uh, online. Uh, of course, if you know somebody in the mountains who lives in an isolated area, you have a friend living in the mountains and you see a lot around them some Fitbit, you know, some Strava heat map, you will know basically that this person, this, this is the, the, the trajectory of this person when they go do their, their running or their, their fitness ac activity, right? So uh, this already can endanger people. Uh, towards like stalkers or, or anybody who wants to rob the house, they might be able to see you know, what your routines are. You're basically becoming very transparent. But in this case, what was interesting is that it had implications beyond personal privacy for national security, in the sense that these are uh, applications that are apparently used by many US military personnel. So of course, if you're in the middle of Syria or Afghanistan or Yemen, and you see up this place with all these nice heat maps uh, with the uh, running tracks, uh, it's probably that there is an American base, and these are probably the, the military um, personnel who are using this for their, their fitness. Uh, so this is, for example, this is one of the, a CIA site that was discovered because of these uh, heat maps. Basically, the, the issue here is that we have many characteristics, a huge universe of uh, combinations. We have uh, sparsity and uniqueness, meaning that each, each of us has a subset of these combinations that is distinct and unique. We have persistence in time, very often, like with location, you don't change your routine every day unless you're a spy and then you take a different route to go to your job, but normal people take the same route. So, one, so th there are many instances in which this information can be collected. There are many opportunities for collecting it and it will stay the same. And that, that means that, is, that these data sets are re-identifiable even, even with noise, even if you perturb a little bit, it's very difficult to really achieve uh, good security. And this has, I think, huge implications for smart cities and for the whole Internet of Things, because their location is very often, if not explicitly, implicitly, in the sense that if you have a sensor, even if location is not part of the data that the sensor is transmitting uh, through the wire, if you know the sensor's location, then whatever the sensor has seen was in that location, right? So it's, uh, sometimes it's so intrinsic that it's very difficult to, to remove without you know, a lot of um, complication, changing the design in, in complex ways. And uh, this has important legal and economic implications uh, in the sense that uh, big legislation, just such as data protection, so GDPR, it has actually different provisions for data depending on whether it is personal data or anonymous data, right? And if you are able to show that you have a data set that is properly anonymized, is properly anonymous, then you are, are, are free to do with it a lot more things than what you should, that you, what you can do if the data is not anonymous. So this is very important. Of course, what does it mean to be anonymous? What's the legal, what's the legal kind of uh, criteria to determine that something is anonymous? This is extremely difficult, even technically, right? So I'm not blaming lawyers for not being able to, to be more precise. Article 29, Working Party, which is uh, made up of the data protection authorities in Europe, uh, they issued some guidelines on anonymization to, type, to bring some clarity on what counts as anonymous data and not. And they identify three characteristics that need to be fulfilled for a data set to be considered anonymous. It means that it's, that it's not possible to single out an individual, meaning that you don't have uniqueness in your data set. 
that it's not possible to link records relating to an individual, meaning that if you have multiple entries that relate to the same individual, you should not be able to relate them and should not be able to relate them to other external data sets that, mm, that also have entries for this individual. And it should not be possible to infer information concerning an individual. This is actually, well, all three are actually very difficult to achieve. I think particularly the last one, not possible to infer information concerning an individual. I mean, the whole uh, aim of big data is to make inferences. So if you are removing the possibility of making inferences, this is, I mean, it's very difficult to have any utility left, right? So it's, uh, data anonymization is very hard. Uh, it remains, I would say it remains an open problem. And um, I, I mean, we are, trying, I, I think in the field there is uh, a lot of attempts to try to find traders, to try to find the sweet spots, to try to optimize the methods, but I think we're a long way from having solutions that are really providing us with, with what would, we would like to have, right, which is like data that is really anonymous, really impossible to reconnect to, to the individuals that is not a threat to, to privacy, <coughs> and that it still is useful to, to do things with it. So basically, if, if you hear people telling you that they are using anonymous data or that they have some tool for anonymization, be very skeptic, okay? And especially if they tell you that yes, it's absolutely fine. If somebody tells me it's absolutely fine, then I know they have no idea what they are talking about. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I prefer them, they tell me, well, you know, there is this risk, there is that risk, there is that risk. If all of this holds, then we are kind of okay then, you know, then I have more confidence that they, they, know, they know what they have in their hands. All right, so that was all about data anonymity. In data anonymity, you are not really, if it's your data, but you're not really part of the picture. Only your data is part of the picture, right? You're, you, you did something, data was collected, it's in some data set, and then now some entity is trying to, to get value out of it in some way. But sometimes you want to be anonymous while you're doing something. So you want to prevent the data collection in the first place. You want to conduct some activity without having a name, just being someone that is not uh, identified, right? So how do you achieve this? For those of you who, who know about security, you know that in the classical security model, you have two people, Alice and Bob, and they send messages to each other and you want to have properties for these messages, right? And you, have to, you want to have these properties towards Eve, who's an adversary, who wants to violate these properties. So you want to have, for example, confidentiality that whatever Alice tells to Bob, Eve is not able to read in the message, right? And you typically achieve that, for example, with end-to-end -end encryption. Or you might want to have authentication that Bob really knows that the message is coming from Alice and not from somebody else. So this is the opposite of uh, anonymity. Or you might want to have integrity in the sense that Bob is convinced that whatever Alice said, nobody else has modified, right? Now, of course, in a model like this, you cannot have anonymity in the sense that we see Alice talking to Bob. End of story, Eve already broke anonymity that she knows that the one talking to Bob is Alice, right? We, we cannot even model it in, in this kind of, of setting. So when we have anonymity, we typically have sets. We have a set of Alice's and we have a set of Bob's. And then, of course, Eve becomes more complicated. Maybe Eve is seeing Alice, but not Bob, or maybe she sees Bob, but not Alice, or maybe she's somewhere in the middle of the network, okay? And the idea here is that it should not be possible to tell which Alice is talking to which Bob. This is what makes you anonymous. Somebody's talking to Bob, but it could be anybody from this set of people, okay? As if I didn't have a name tag here, and we, we would have uh, some anonymous uh, uh, system, you would not know which is the tag that corresponds to the person speaking, right? I mean, this is a bit of a contrived example, but just to get an idea. So the, the message here is that you cannot be anonymous on your own. You cannot. You can have confidentiality on your own. You can create a key, encrypt your data, put it in your cloud, and it's, you're done. You don't need anybody else, right? You just keep your, your key secret, you're done. If you want to talk to me uh, confidentially, you just need me to have a key and we agree on something, we run a protocol, we are fine, okay? End-to-end -end encryption, you just need to have the two ends, have the key, be convinced of the key of the other and have a good crypto algorithm, we have many that exist, done, okay? With anonymity, it's not like that. You need a crowd of people. You need others that could be you. 
because otherwise you're not anonymous. Anonymous is anonymous within a set. Within, I mean, the biggest set you could have is humans, the all humans on Earth, right? That's the biggest set. Typically, you will have smaller sets, but you will be anonymous within a set. And you want this crowd of people to be diverse, because if they are all like you, maybe your anonymity, maybe the end goal of your anonymity property is also not very much fulfilled. And um, so, for example, uh, if you're a policeman and you're investigating uh, a crime and you're, you're kind of uh, going to some online pages to find information where criminals share information, for example, it's not enough to have a crowd that you could be anybody from the police station because criminals don't care if you're Agent John or Agent Peter. They just care that you're a cop, right? So you need to have a crowd that is diverse, that is not just, oh, any cop in this uh, police station, but it has to be a person that is also maybe potentially a criminal, right? And is one of them, and they shouldn't be you know, concerned about this person looking at what they are saying. So you need diversity. That's very important. That's, it's difficult to achieve as well. Not only that, but when you have anonymity, like at which layer do you put this anonymity mechanism, right? So you could, you could think of RF fingerprints. So my phone or devices, they, they emit uh, signals uh, that are very unique. They, they have like a fingerprint, they're like an identifier, like a biometric of the device, right? So you could identify that at the physical layer if you have physical access to the radio frequency emanations of a device. It could be that the IP address is your identifier. So you remember when I said that depends on what the name is about. So one of the possible names is your IP address. And typically in anonymous communications, which I will speak uh, in, in a minute, uh, identifying you means finding your IP address. So IP address is, is like the name you're trying to find. It could be that uh, it's not the IP address, but it could be that I can identify your device through some fingerprint of the software that you have or the hardware that you have. Or maybe I identify you based on your writing style, so you, you have a wonderful technical system that allows you to speak anonymously and post things anonymously in ways that are completely untraceable looking at the internet communication, but you have this such, such distinctive writing style that, I, that is just recognizable uh, and, and you can be identified based on, on, on the way you, you talk or maybe any other behavioral data or usage data. data. And this is not even complete. I mean, there are, there are more, more things that you could, more layers where you might need to, to address the anonymity issue. So here the message is that the, the, the leakage that enables de-anonymization or re-identification can occur at multiple layers. So when you have a solution for anonymity, you're typically addressing one of these layers. You have to be very clear about what your assumptions are about other layers. And you have to be very careful that you're not leaking information at other layers in ways that are very easy for an adversary to break your anonymity properties. Okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, go, go to, to the web, right? So web tracking is a set of techniques that uh, is, are used by websites or other web entities to try to identify you and to try to compile a digital dossier of your online activities. Five minutes. Wow. Okay. Um, so the way, the way this tracking is done is often uh, through cookies. So the way this works is that you have a, um, you, you go to a web page and the web page uh, uh, loads and with the loading of the web page, a little file is set in your computer with an identifier that is called a cookie. And this way, when you go back to the, to the web page, they can recognize you and have some preferences like your language, your region, maybe your shopping cart, authentication, status, and so on. Now, that's usually not so much of a problem. More problematic is that you have third parties sometimes in these web pages that might kind of uh, rent space in the web page and also are able to put cookies in your computer. So for example, here this advertiser.com in the middle has bought advertising in the news and in the cure cancer pages and they are able to set a cookie on the, us on the user's computer when they go to the news and then when that user goes to the cure cancer uh, page, they are able to recognize and say, okay, this is the same person going to this page and that page, okay. So, I mean, cookies are, you can, you can delete them, right? You have an interface in browsers that allows you to go to your cookies and delete them. Now, the problem is that in the back end, these entities often do what is called cookie syncing, which is that they match and they exchange identifiers. They exchange the names through which they know people. 
so that they can synchronize their databases and do data backend database mergers, right? So you think you have different identities towards different entities, but they're actually connecting those in the background. And then another thing they do is use other storage mechanisms in the browser that do not have an easy interface to de for deletion and uh, put their identifiers that if you delete your cookies, they can still re-read -re these identifiers and regenerate your cookies. So these are called zombie cookies. They, they never go away, right? You cannot kill them. So this is very aggressively trying to identify you online, basically. Now, a more advanced, even more advanced than, than this cookie-based tracking is uh, what we can call device or browser fingerprinting. This is a passive technique. It was uh, first uh, brought uh, to light by the EFF. Uh, they, they had this study in which they said a web page, invited people to visit it, and they would run scripts that, uh, that, tried to, uh, that, that collected information about the browser, such as the fonts that are installed, the screen size, the region, the language, blah, blah, blah. And they found that, again, uniqueness comes back, right? So 94% were unique, and it showed the feasibility of identifying uh, devices without keeping any state, so without keeping any files in the computer, uh, just uh, by measuring these characteristics. We did a follow-up study, then we said, okay, is this, is this our, our web pages doing this? So we did a follow-up study and uh, a crawl of the web, and we found that indeed these techniques are present in, in a few hundreds of sites of the top Alexa sites. And uh, more advanced techniques use uh, canvas fingerprinting. This is about uh, printing some... Um, using the Canvas API, printing something on invisibly on your screen, reading it, and then that also gives a fingerprint of what kind of uh, graphics card you have, what kind of uh, the whole hardware, and it can be used as an identifier as well. And this is also prevalent in another follow-up study it was shown to be prevalent. So this is even, you can, with cookies you can at least find that you are being tracked, with this you, you have no idea unless you are doing, you know, this, this kind of studies looking at runtime and looking at what this, these scripts are, are doing. Um, when it comes to anonymity, you're probably uh, familiar with um, uh, anonymous communication uh, systems, such as a store. Um, this is the most famous network, it has been running for 15 years, it has 2 million users and 7,000 uh, um, relays. The way this works is basically, is a bit like, uh, a VPN is kind of a mini version of this, right? So the way this works is this, this person, Alice, she wants to go to the new site, but she doesn't want to reveal her IP address to the new site. So instead of connecting directly, she's going to use proxies. So she will redirect, use this, these onions, which are routers, they, they, they will use as proxies to redirect her communication. So the first thing she has to do is uh, find out about this network. So she downloads from a directory authority the addresses and keys of the, the nodes in the network. Then she selects uh, some of them to construct her circuit. And then she constructs her, uh, she, she creates her package. It's, it's encrypted multiple times, right? Um, so the, the black uh, dot, the black package there is what she wants to send to the news. If she was going directly to the news, she would just send that directly, okay? But she, because she's going through this network, she has to do something additional with it. So what she will do will, we, is that she wraps that in a layer of encryption for the last uh, relay, R3, and that she wraps in a layer of encryption for the second relay, R2, and that she wraps in a layer of encryption for the first relay. So in reverse order, it's like an onion, you put layers on it, right? And then she sends that to the first one, who strips the first layer of encryption, the blue, sends the rest, who strips the orange, sends to the R3, who strips the, the green, and then the black goes to the news, right? And if you see here, like the first one uh, only sees that Alice is doing something, but they don't know where she's going. The last one knows that some anonymous person is going to this new site, but they cannot see Alice. The one in the middle just sees that somebody is doing something, but they don't see any of the two ends. Okay? Now, with respect to adversaries, of course, this is to protect you from the new site, so you, you don't want the new site to, to know your IP address, to identify you, and that works. It's also meant to protect you from your local ISP or network administrators so that they don't know which websites you're visiting. They just see you going to R1. So it's like you go to the VPN, they cannot see what, what is beyond that. Or maybe, and of course you have to consider that maybe some of these entities in the network are compromised and you should also protect, be protected against those. Now, what this does not protect against is um, against um, adversaries that can see both ends because then they can sort of correlate uh, the, the traffic patterns that they see on both ends and break anonymity. So this, this is not good enough for that kind of adversary. Okay, I'm gonna skip website fingerprinting. 
just stylometry and conclusions. So uh, as I said also that you can be identified by, by your writing style. Your, everybody's writing style is unique. Uh, <laughs> And uh, basically what you do here is that, that you extract f linguistic features from text. You need um, about you know, 7,000 words to extract uh, uh, features. And the features you extract are like use of function words, punctuation, use of synonyms, n-grams, and all of that. You extract many, many features. You train a classifier. And then when you get the anonymous text, you run it through this classifier, and then you uh, identify the author. Um, this is not perfect, but it's actually pretty effective. So one of the m main results is that for uh, 100,000 authors, they had a 20% accuracy. That means that 20% you, you, you find. And in 35% of the cases, the author was in the top 20 guesses out of 100,000. So imagine you have 100,000 Twitter accounts. You run this, and you have reduced your candidates to 20. This is already very, very good in terms of uh, uh, narrowing down your search. OK, so coming to... Conclusions, the, the main message is that the anonymity in digital context is very difficult to achieve. It, it's extremely hard because of the uniqueness of people, their behavior, their location, their preferences, their characteristics, their devices, their configurations. So too much uniqueness means that, that yeah, you cannot be confused with others. You don't have an anonymity set. There are vast amounts of data available, which is kind of as a kind of a memory and a kind of background information that they can be correlated with whichever observation you create uh, when you're trying to do something anonymously. And of course, all this information is easily linkable and you can make uh, inference from, from it with today's computing power. Anonymous da anonymized data is likely re-identifiable for some realistic adversaries. So please, when you hear anonymization claims, take them you know, with a, a lot of salt. And, um, if you want to access uh, services anonymously, you require a crowd of people, and you have to have protection of multiple layers, because if you're only protecting one layer, chances are your name, your identification can be done at different layers, either through your writing style, through your network IP, or other things that you didn't take into account in your solution. So, and even then, when you have like really good technological, so technical solutions, it's often a, an arms race, because I mean, we keep having you know, attacks and improving the systems, and it's a very much a moving target but it's a very exciting field of research as well. So thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have time for maybe one or two qu very quick questions. Silence. Um, maybe a quick question from me. So, so, uh, the, if the goal is anonymity, um, shouldn't one also be concerned about the uh, bad uses of anonymity as well as the good ones? Uh, that didn't come into your uh, Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, anything can be used for, for good and for evil, right? Uh, the thing is that uh, there are many good uses of anonymity, and we don't have a space uh, to exercise uh, those uses today. So that is one of the problems. The other problem is that uh, when you want to do harm, and that is, and you're willing to break the law, you are in a very different position from a normal user. In the sense that, for example, we said that location tra location identifies 95% of people with four points. But if you are involved in criminal business, you would change your patterns, and you would you would kind of adapt to the system to be under the radar, right? So in the end, uh, when you have uh, systems that, that have this fuzzy that is not anonymous but is not completely identifiable. This, uh, there are many such systems uh, existing and criminals can very easily exploit and adapt because for them, I mean, I'm not going to change my, my route to work just to not be tracked. Why, wh why would I do that? It's just too much cost for no benefit. But if I was involved in whatever drug trafficking, maybe that would make sense, right? So in a sense, the, the, the capacity of the bad guys to use multiple um, channels is already there. Mm. And people who want to use anonymity for legitimate purposes, they don't really have much uh, that they can do. OK. I'm sure there's much more we could discuss on that point. But uh, in the interest of time, uh, we'll, we'll have to take further questions offline. But let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.